this is an introduction. This is an overview of what we're going to be talking about. We might not even use up the whole hour unless you have questions or requests. Um, the the uh, the class I should start by saying is really in depth. <laughs> so this is and it is a text based class to a great extent because while I'll certainly be talking about events, the evidence that we have in so many ways of the anti-Semitism that we can get easy access to is from the things that people wrote, depending on how far back you write, you, you go. Anti-Semitism is, is so complicated and so thorny an issue that you know we're arguing about it right now. And in fact, the presentation that I'm going to make, and it's not going to be, it's not going to be a week from this Friday, because I needed to spend a little bit more time on it. But even that presentation about the rise of anti-Semitism on the left, I, 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 I'm writing a commentary about this for the newsletter tomorrow. I've heard more feedback about that presentation before giving it <laughs> <laughs> than I normally do after uh, delivering a presentation, which is, you know, I understand why, because people are sensitive to uh, many of the issues that are um, that are being discussed today as anti-Semitism. It hasn't always been that difficult to put your finger on it. Israel and Zionism made it a little harder. And that's what I would almost call is, you know, Zionism 301. That's advanced, advanced. But we're going to hit it at some point. And it just so happens that I wrote about it for tomorrow's newsletter uh, with regard to really the questions of Israel is anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism. And what I'm planning to do on that on that evening presentation, on which has now been rescheduled to uh, February 16th, by the way. I need a little bit more time to develop it. And I'm supposed to be traveling this week if the weatherman allows me to, uh, since we're driving. But we're going to be going very, very far back. And we're going to be following this pernicious thing of Jew hatred from antiquity, as far back as we can claim actual historical detail, all the way through to these issues that I'm talking about today, the things that make it more complicated and more political, especially in a world where there is both legitimate criticism of some things Jews do, some things some Jews do, which would be Zionism and Israel, because the, the, the Jews have reestablished themselves, ourselves, or their selves in a, uh, in a place of sovereignty, which means that they're answerable for things. And by the same token, uh, there is also real real hatred of Jews still in the world. Many uh, conspiracy theories, many uh, terrible ideas about us. Anti-Semitism is, as you'll learn through the course, is very unique. Anti-Semitism is not simply one set of stereotypes directed to the Jews. And in that way, it very much differs from various kinds of hatreds over time. We're in the United States, we have this, this very uh, wonderful, broad, uh, uh, diverse population. When you think of certain groups, you think of certain things. That's what stereotyping is about. With the Jews, because maybe of the antiquity, because people use us as to, to paste on or to project any agenda that they may have of their own, we cover the gamut. So for instance, when we look later at the famous forgery, which purports to be a transcript of the quote unquote elders of Zion meeting to plot their takeover of the world, symbolized by the way, in both Nazi, uh, Nazi uh, art and also in uh, uh, things that you see to this very day of this octopus, taking over the globe. When we talk about that, we're going to see how the Jews are accused in that document of being both hyper-capitalists, using their wealth to control people, and communists, 
infiltrating the world of labor, and you name it. There's almost nothing that the Jews are not accused of being. And this is very much in line with how anti-Semitism has functioned for people throughout history. Not only that, anti-Semitism can be broken down into various components. So I've already mentioned that we have this nationalist component that's emerged in the last 100 years through the development and the implementation of Zionism. And we'll go into that into some detail. Both, it can be seen as a reaction to anti-Semitism and a generator of, in some cases, new anti-Semitism. But we also have anti, what my professors used to call anti-Judaism, which is a variant of anti-Semitism. I suppose we could think about it like a virus. We're all good at understanding now when a new variant breaks out. So new variants of concern emerge new ways of understanding the Jews. So what would be a new variant of concern? Well, it's very old now, but anti-Judaism would be one where the beliefs of the Jews are specifically what are under attack and not necessarily the Jews as a corpus, as a, as a, as a people, as an ethnic identity. Other times it's the Jews as a tribal group. Much later in history, although it's pretty much defining or definitive uh, now, because so many of us think about it this way, thanks to the Nazis, it's Jews as a race. But even there, Jews as a race is drawing on ideas about racial composition of people that don't comport with today's understandings of what it means to be a race, because racism and race is so socially constructed. And so Jews can turn around and say, we are of many races. What it means to be a Jew is also a very complicated issue because we come from a time and we've maintained a variety of identities that could all of which can come under attack that are that is not really the way we define tend to define people today, at least in the West. The best I can come up with is that we are some kind of ethno religio tribal ancient group with ancient roots and origins. And that is really unsatisfying because we want to be able to say, as Americans tend to, we're a religion. Well, you know, we're a group of humanistic Jews sitting in this room, uh, in this Zoom, who obviously know that religion is not the best way to talk about it. But even if we were believe believing Jews, there's there's no reality that suggests that we are one religion. I suppose you could say we are, but... Uh, over in West Bloomfield, they've got women chanting Torah and calling themselves rabbis, and just a few miles away, maybe not even miles away, you've got women who have to sit in the back or on the side or whatever of, of the Orthodox or the Chabad synagogue. So are they practicing the same religion? You know, that's a very, very difficult question. And you've got Jews for Jesus. Are they even Jews at all? Lots of people consider that to be the one area where they are, where we really are going to exclude people. The most pluralistic Jews I've ever met in the world. When I go to these uh, Jewish People Policy Institute, that's a thing, organizational <laughs> gatherings, usually sponsored by federations, and something in Israel usually too, they will sit and talk about, let's be as pluralistic as we can, let's be as accommodating, and then when you do little projects with them, guess which group always automatically gets excluded? It's Jews for Jesus. Well, believe it or not, that's because of anti-Semitism. Why? Well, not because we're being anti-Semitic towards those people, but because Christianity became one of the earliest and most powerful sources of anti-Judaism, the sort of Omicron, Alpha, Omega, I don't know what you want to call it, variant of the anti-Semitism virus. And so we are definitely going to spend time on looking at anti-Semitism in the Christian world. And then we're also going to be surprised that, uh, maybe not surprised, we're going to talk about how you got out of it. And you could get out of it. In some cases, we'll learn, for instance, how Central European Jews frequently 
sometimes converted to Christianity. There's an argument about whether it was frequent or only occasional. Converted to Christianity and simply disappeared into the vast Christendom, emerging Christendom of, of, of Europe. Um, and then we will also learn about the Spanish, uh, both the Inquisition and the uh, the the creation of um, a whole group of people who we now call in Hebrew Anusim, uh, who were con conversos in Spanish or Ladino, people who converted either willingly or against their will, but even when willingly, were still treated differently. And we'll identify that as the beginning of what we call a racialized form of anti-Semitism and how that began to sort of mix together with this Christian medieval anti-Semitism. So we're going to be all around the place. We're going to go to the Enlightenment and the Emancipation. And we're going to talk about how the most enlightened people in the French Enlightenment still had many, many big issues with Jews and what that meant and how that played out. And of course, we'll talk about uh, the protocols, the elders of Zion, the Holocaust, and so forth. But where I want to start, actually, and I'm sorry, I have to get up my proper notes here. Oh, here we go. Just to scroll. What I want to start with is the word anti-Semitism. And this is going to take us a few thousand years into the the area from the area that we're really going to start in. When I first, when I took my first in-depth anti-Semitism class with Professor Michael Meyer, who's this great scholar at the Hebrew Union College, a, a phenomenal historian. He's quite retired now, but uh, just one of my favorite uh, scholars of all time. He was advocating, and this is in the 1980s, for changing the spelling of the word. So I'm not going to pull up the whiteboard and everything, because I think we all know how English looks. Uh, but you've seen anti-Semitism spelled, I assume, in a number of different ways, right? Has anybody noticed something maybe more recent about the spelling of the word? So you can raise your hand and I'll call on you, or you can just put you... All right, Charlie, what, did, what have you noticed recently? The hyphen went away. The hyphen went away, as did the, you probably also noticed the capital S, right? Capital S went away. Well. Um, there's a reason for this. And he was one of the first proponents of this. And he he really had a great deal of trouble getting people to recognize. Boy, was he, he was a German Jew. Not, he himself was not, well, that's not true. He was German. He was a German Jew who came over as a child. Um, but, you know, German Jews are known to be particularly obsessive about things. And so Dr. Meyer, uh, with his with his unique obsessiveness, contacted in the days before email, every every encyclopedia, every dictionary, everybody in, was in charge of the English language at the New York Times or the Washington Post or you name it, to try to get them to understand why the word anti-Semitism needed to be changed to one word, all lowercase. Why did this man, this truly brilliant man, why did he care so much about this? And why have we finally, and this took 30 some odd years, why are we finally starting to see this? This is one of the ironies of anti-Semitism. It's so anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitism is so horrible that even the name for it can be used to be anti-Semitic. Try to think a more clever way to say that. That's about the best I can I can do. And the only way to really understand that is for me to go through the story of where the word comes from. And in so, you know, as I do this, hopefully you'll see some of the aspects of the phenomenon that we're going to be talking about. Um, and I, you know, I don't mean to, you have to have a little bit of a sense of humor in a class like this, because, you know, a lot of this was was serious stuff. We're talking about people, you know, dying, and and the Jewish people almost. You want to talk about a genocide? The the people, the Jewish people, still have not made up our numbers since World War II. I don't know if folks are aware of that. Um, despite the fact that one of the aspects of anti-Semitism is that people think there's a whole hell of a lot more of us than there really are. I assume most of you know how many Jews there are in the world, right? Anybody think it's more than seventeen? 16, 17 million people. 
Okay, good. So you're 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 at least well informed in that, and I'm glad to see that. We're obviously so tiny; we're almost incalculably small, and yet the world is just obsessed with us. And it's not just because of Israel, because this has been going on for a very very long time, and we'll have to tear that apart too. So, anti-Semitism, as we've said, has had a number of different ways of spelling it. It is considered to be a part of a part of racism, but it's not named after a race. There is no such thing as a Semite. There is never such thing as a Semite. Now, certainly, some scholars will refer to ancient Semitic peoples. They are not talking about ancient people who had some racial characteristic. Semitic is a language family. So when we talk about ancient Semitic peoples, we're talking about ancient peoples who spoke various forms of ancient Semitic languages. And there were a number of them. There's very few that survived, but two that did for really different reasons were Arabic, for instance, which migrated from the Mesopotamian area down into the Arabian Peninsula. And another one that survived is Hebrew. It really is Canaanite. And the Semitic groups were more or less native to Canaan. You know, nobody's native to anywhere, to be honest, except Central Africa, Central and Southern Africa. We all moved somewhere. Otherwise, we wouldn't have populated the earth and we'd also be sitting still in the middle of Africa. We all moved somewhere. We all got somewhere. So we, got, we all got everywhere somehow. But when we start talking about, you know, civilizational times, when we might have some written evidence of of, uh, of our languages and not just speculating back to some kind of proto language as linguists like to do, we find that there is this, uh, this sort of proto-Semitic that then we begin to see evidence of. There are times that people find examples of ancient Hebrew, and we're not even sure, was it really ancient Hebrew or was it really proto proto-Hebrew? Is it this one, that one, the other, because there's so few words and they were the same in all those languages. But at some point, and this happened in Germany, the word Semite became a, a synonym for Jews among some very hardcore late 19th century, mid to late 19th century German anti-Semites. Um, <laughs> Because of this, in today's language, and just go on social media and you'll find this, if you were, for instance, to say that some, let's say, let's use the example that uh, that represents the conflict in Israel and the Arab countries and, and Palestinians, uh, that, that a Palestinian was anti-Semitic. I don't think there's anybody who would doubt that Hamas has profoundly anti-Semitic platform and belief system. If you don't believe that, you're probably in the wrong class. But then you will see, how can Hamas be anti-Semitic? They're Semites. No, they're not Semites. And we're not Semites either. We were assigned Semitism, if you will, whatever that is. We were assigned it by a group of sort of pseudo-scientific, not sort of, completely pseudo-scientific racial categorization kooks with a lot of influence in Germany. So today, unfortunately, the very word that should have properly been Jew hatred, and when I'm feeling very feisty about talking about it, I will just say Jew hatred, became this sort of pseudo-scientific terminology that was shared by this very uh, th this very hating group of people to distinguish themselves from the Aryan races, which of course also don't exist. And this is where I'll do my little aside that I always do. There's no such thing as race. It's a cultural construct. It is not a biological reality. Human beings can all interbreed with each other. We are considered one species. I hope everyone knows that by now. Um, race, the better word for race might be caste. I like Isabel Wilkerson's book, Caste, by the way, which talks about how caste exists in almost uh, every society and that people decide who's going to be what based on their own needs and realities. 
If the Jews were so obviously a different race, the way Americans understand the word race, the Nazi regime would not have had to put a label on us, physically attach a star. They even changed their names. Uh, Rosalie has a comment. The Israeli Saturday Night Live, Live uh, has a skit about denial, denying Jews live twenty five hundred years. Yeah, we're gonna we are gonna talk about that at some point. We are gonna talk about that. It's I'm not gonna address it very much on um, February sixteenth, but I might mention it a little bit too. Um, I, I'm I'm hesitant to bring my my big joke in. I'm not sure if I'm gonna have it or not, but uh, there there is there is certainly this new thing too of erasing any Jewish connection to the East, but it's not that new. It started as a right wing, uh, uh, it started as a right wing uh, trope and it's now drifted over to the left. Um, but this idea that, you know, now, now suddenly we're not, we, we have no connections to the ancient Near East. That's a, it's a little bit of an aside in terms of this introduction, but it is very important. And I've seen those sketches from, um, from Eretz Nehederet is the name of the show, yeah. by the way, if you want to quote it. Um, well, and, and they're not happy. Let, let me interrupt. Yeah, yeah. I, the last one that uh, just um, lacerated or macerated, whatever they did, the Columbia and the various university personnel, the Harvard personnel, because of the stand and, and the denial that, that the, the Jews actually existed. I, I imagine you saw that. But I would that, encourage one, actually, that one I didn't think was as uh, maybe oh. I didn't see that one. The one I was thinking of was the one with Jesus. Yeah. Um, but uh, because yeah. because and we're going to talk about when we talk about Christian anti-Semitism, there has been a lot recently that has been calling upon Christian blood libel and Christian erasure of Judaism and of Jews. Uh, and and the funniest one, the funniest sketch they put together, I think, was when they when they show up to greet the baby Jesus and they discover that he's a Judean, a Jew, um, which is somehow impossible because there were no Jews there before, what, 1948, according to what the professor they bring along with them tells That's them. Right. So, uh, but we're, we, we are going to get there slowly but surely. We'll see how many little boxes I still have on my screen when we're done with this class, because it is very much uh, a, a, an effort to go deeply into the topic. And like I said, it's, it's a text class. Uh, we're going to be looking at um, ancient Greek texts about Jews and uh, finding out how this, how this started to the best of our ability. Uh, but just getting back to this, uh, these Germans who invented this nonsense about a Semitic race were also very, very into their own nonsense about being an Aryan race. And as I said, uh, it doesn't doesn't it doesn't track very well <clears throat> with our idea as Americans of race because we've created an idea of race that's really it's black and white, and then there's some brown people hanging around more and more recently. Um, and then there's Asian people who have their own sort of subcategory. And depending on, you know, if we're at war with them or not, we depict them in certain ways. But for Americans, it's largely been about the descendants of Black people who were brought over as enslaved folks and the rest of us. And that's why Americans don't always understand this and we don't always get it. If you went to South Africa, Trevor Noah will tell you this, the, uh, the definitions were different. Hell, they were even different in, in Louisiana. So what we're learning here is about how human beings divide each other up. I wonder, you know, I, I've always wondered whether like dogs who are, they have very slippery DNA, right, with their appearance. It's so easy. They're all wolves, right? Nobody denies that all dogs are wolves. The chihuahua is just as much a dog as a, um, as, as a German shepherd. They're all dogs, right? They all basically do the same dog thing, and even though they all look very different. Do you think they sit around and like gather together? And say, you know, he's not really a dog, is he? He's really, he's really, a, he's really something else, isn't he? He's not like us. I mean, they would have to do. There's millions of varieties, and it only takes two of them to, you know, create a whole brand new kind. So, this, you know, this is something that that uh, makes absolutely no sense. But it made sense to a guy named Wilhelm Marr, who in 1879 is a German journalist and pr prominent Jew hater, who. Uh, <laughs> who decided that he wanted to somehow separate Judaism as a religion, which had been the target of so much anti-Jewish vitriol, and don't think it didn't extend to a kind of racialized version of hatred. It did, whenever they would tell the uh, the stories of Jesus and so forth. 
Um, but he really wanted to create a pseudoscientific, or he would say scientific, kind of uh, a, a way to to be uh, to separate what he would call Judentum, Judaism, and Semitismus. And in creating Semitismus, <laughs> meaning Semitism, he created what for Germans was a racialized idea of being a Jew. And ultimately, if there was Semitismus, there was going to be Antisemitismus. This pamphlet that he published, it was called The Way to Victory of the German Spirit Over the Jewish or, or, or the Spirit of Semitismus. Uh, it became very popular among a certain group of uh, what I, I think uh, some people call the romantic uh, nationalists. They organized what was one of the first leagues of anti-Semites using that word. Uh, I, I'm German is very hard, but I, for me to pronounce, but Antisemiten Liga, the League of Anti-Semites. Germans can turn anything into one word, right? Um, and it was the first cultural organization in Germany um, to uh, or German or a political organization to fight the Jews, to fight the idea that Jews were polluting and poisoning German culture with their with their even their uh, secular contributions. The fact that this started in Germany is really telling, because Germany was a very special case for the Jews. Natan does a much better class than I can do on the place of the uh, of the Jews in the in the Enlightenment and how the emancipation affected us. Although we are going to talk about that later on, but the the beginnings of uh, of um, Enlightenment and the consequent emancipation of the Jews in Germany made cre it created a lot of uh, sort of um, uh, ironies. Um, Germany was never the the biggest Jewish place. Uh, and, and if it had ever had a major Jewish population, most of them had moved east in the 14th century as a result of all kinds of Jew hatred. But the the Jews who remained or the Jews who went there afterwards, they were never that numerous. Um, there, there, were, there were more Jews, way more Jews to the east, millions and millions of more Jews to the east, but they were the first group that, for a variety of reasons, one of them being that Germany was not one country, and that there were some friendly uh, kings here and there, and emperors here and there. That uh, Frederick the Great, for instance, who, as a, you know, viewing themselves as enlightened, I suppose, <clears throat> wanted to emancipate their Jews or give some rights to the Jews. It became kind of a, a of a laboratory for what would happen if Jews stopped being Jews. Now, it still wasn't super easy to do that there. There was no, there was no recognition of, um, of being a Jew that was not in some way connected to religion. They were, they were all connected to religion. Let me just take a drink of water. But more and more in the, the 1700s and into the 1800s, Jews were disconnecting from it. And there's a whole Jewish studies class you could take about the effect that had on Judaism. Ultimately, it, it, it produced reform Judaism. It was an effort by Jews, by Jewish thinkers, to stem assimilation by creating a Judaism that was more, more user-friendly, more German-friendly. That was what was happening on the inside. Moses Mendelssohn, if you know that name, was an example of this. And people like Moses Mendelssohn, who, by the way, never stopped being a religious Jew, he was an observant Jew, they had also sort of made their way into polite society. He was a philosopher with other Jews, Jewish, uh, uh, non-Jewish friends who were philosophers. And so they were beginning to make their way in. There were yet other Jews, and many of them, who were just dropping any connection to Judaism. And these were the ones specifically that people like Wilhelm Marr were most concerned about because he saw them as hiding in the Aryan population. Uh, take, for instance, Moses Mendelssohn's grandchildren. Not a one of them was Jewish, but one of them, please tell me uh, who, they, who he was, a famous composer. Yes, Audrey? Felix. Felix, one of them 
was a famous, I suppose you'd call him non-Jewish composer, but he wasn't seen as non-Jewish by the anti semitin Liga. He was seen as Jewish. And you could see here the racialization of the Jew in the uh, uh, in the uh, German in German terms, in German terms and German ways of understanding what racial what what race meant. So this word begins to spread. Later we get a word called philosemitism, which, by the way, may not always be so friendly to the Jews because it still sees us as super different. And then we wind up, although it's preferable, far preferable. <laughs> there were a lot of those in England. <laughs> You know, it's you can be loved you can be loved too much as well uh and then you have to you have to put up with, put up with other kinds of things uh sort of like stalking <laughs> that's how i view it um so what about in antiquity let's let's move off this for a minute so now you know where the word came from and why it's problematic and why in its problematic nature um, it 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 meant that at some point we needed to do something about it. And let me hold off on antiquity for a minute because I forgot to close the section. This is why Michael Meyer and so many people stopped calling it anti-dash capital S Semitism. Because Semitismus was a German anti-Jewish word, a creation to racialize the Jews of Germany. To be anti-them was to be what they were saying. And he felt that the word just needed to be turned into like any other word where we forget its origins and just use it as a word. I used to believe, and I, I remember arguing with him about this, that the best thing to do would just be to eliminate it all together and just use what I said before, Jew hatred. Let's just use Jew hatred. It's much easier. Now, today we wouldn't have come up with Jew hatred because this is how bad we are with language. We would have come up with Judeophobia. I mean, I, I I certainly use the words homophobia and Islamophobia. I mean, they're English, right? But phobia is not hatred. Phobia is fear. There's arachnophobia. That one I that one I proudly confess to. There's arachnophobia, but it doesn't mean I hate them. In fact, I'm quite appreciative of their contribution to our environment. So I'm perfectly happy to be called an arachnophobe. I do not hate people who are who are Islam, Muslim, but uh, if I did hate them, it would be yes, perhaps because deep down psychologically I feared them, but that would not be an adequate, and I don't think it's an adequate description for how people have behaved around them in the United States around that whole issue, and nor is anti-Semitism an adequate way to describe it. Anti-Semitism, though, is the word we're stuck with. So he felt that by removing all the capital letters and getting rid of the hyphen, at least you turn it into just a word. Just a word, a word that in time people would forget the origins of. I'm not sure they will, because they're still telling us on Facebook and, and Instagram and Twitter that, that Arab peoples, for instance, can't be anti-Semitic that, that uh, uh, Hamas is not an anti-Semitic organization because that contradicts the, the use of the word because they too are Semites. I mean, the whole thing is nonsense, but that's where we are. All right, so that's why we're going to spell it with a lowercase letter, with all lowercase letters and no hyphen. And that's why people are starting to do that. Any questions on that before I get on to the next, the next piece? Okay, so in the time that we have remaining, Let's talk about anti-Semitism in antiquity. So it's not exactly clear, even though we do call it the world's oldest hatred, I think maybe sometimes it's more appropriate to call it the world's most slippery and consistent and constant hatred. And the way, reason I say slippery, it's much like the DNA of dogs. It's what I referred to earlier. It changes its face all the time. Sometimes it's racial in the way the Germans understood it. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's religious. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's political, like it is today. Sometimes it's not. I'm asking the question in my newsletter commentary, is, is it ipso facto anti-Semitic to be anti-Zionist? Now, I happen to believe that a lot of people who are anti-Zionist are anti-Semitic. 
and that that's their motivation. But I also know some people who are not. I don't, for instance, believe, this is, this is in my commentary, <laughs> but I've shared it with some people. I don't believe Rashida Tlaib is an anti-Semite. And not because she's also a Semite, because she's not a Semite and I'm not a Semite. So that's not why I don't believe she's not anti-Semitic. I believe she's anti-Zionist because she doesn't think that that's the way that piece of land should have come out. That's where her family's from. And she thinks it's incompatible with uh, law, the rules of, neo, of, of, of liberal democracy. <laughs> and so she doesn't believe that this is in any way something that's legitimate for there to be a Jewish sovereign presence in a piece of land that she and her family grew up on. Other people, it's not a connection to the, the fact that their family grew, grew up on. They think it's incompatible. Um, I don't think calling Israel apartheid, even though, by the way, it's incorrect, I don't think it's necessarily anti-Semitic. It is a little apartheidish in the West Bank. Don't get me wrong. <clears throat> but inside Israel, where the, where the borders and boundaries are, where 95% of Israelis live, it may not be the most uh, heavenly place in the world for 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 uh, um, Israeli Arabs or Israeli Palestinians, whatever you want to call them, because they also call themselves all kinds of things. But it's not apartheid, not by a long, 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 long way, not even slightly resembling it. Not unless black people were sitting on the Supreme Court of Africa while de Klerk was the uh, was the leader of that country. Uh, I don't remember that happening. Maybe you do. Um, so it, 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 there are certainly things that people can say that are anti-Zionist. They don't believe that, that Jews deserve sovereignty. One of the things I did write about my commenta in my commentary tomorrow is that the, the Anti-Defamation League will tell you that it is uniquely the Jews of all peoples in the world who are denied sovereignty, political sovereignty, except that's not true. It's not true. There are plenty of peoples who don't have political sovereignty. The Kurds don't have it. The Quebecois don't have it. The Basques don't have it. And nobody's saying that they're, there's something unique about the Basques, that we all hate them so much, that they're the one group that doesn't get it. And I, you could go on and on and on. Now, again, Jews have this history of hatred. So probably, I haven't done a poll, but I would bet you a significant number of anti-Zionists are using it as cover for anti-Judaism and anti-Jewishness, just plain old Jew hatred. But guess what? In preparing for February 16th, I found plenty, 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 plenty of examples, some of them linked to Israel, most of them not, of Jew hatred on the left that's going on right now that uh, did not require me to interpret them as solely anti-Zionist. They were too clearly going over the boundary, and it's happening more and more, and I'm only going to focus on them. So no one will say, well, Jeff simply took examples that were anti-Zionist and called them anti-Semitic. There won't be one of those because unfortunately there's too many of the other. So there you have it. You have it racialized, religious, religion-based. You have it politicized today. And you could come up with all kinds of other reasons too. But when did it start? Is it really the world's most ancient? Probably not but maybe the maybe the longest running you know sort of like on broadway a show opens and closes but stays out there a really long time um this one doesn't seem to have a closing date and if there's some places where it's not playing these days i guarantee you it'll have a it'll have a a revival and usually with some brand new elements to it just like any good broadway show when we look back at certain um legends in judaism we don't really see it. In fact, we see the opposite. We see a lot of, a lot of um, uh, sort of uh, supremacy among Jews. Uh, I we wouldn't call them Jews at that time. We call them Israelites. But you know the the legend, and thank goodness it's a legend of uh, of Joshua, who was Moses's successor, invading the land of Israel, and the things that he is said to have done to the Canaanites that were there. Um, that's that's pretty horrible. And that was the Jew being sort of, you know, a Jew uber alles, to borrow the Nazi language. Uh, fortunately, we know that did not happen, believe it or not. There was no Joshua. There was no conquest, actually. That was in their imagination. It was a way of sort of elevating 
uh, their own thing. And in other classes that I've taught, you could take them with me in the future, or some of you took them in the past. We talk about how the Jews are actually, or the Israelites or the Hebrews are actually native to Canaan, as native to Canaan as any other Canaanites. Um, the whole purpose of these tales were to sort of differentiate themselves from other Canaanites because they weren't all that different. They were not all that different. Later on, when they started to tell the stories, they wanted to be different because they felt they had done something really spectacular by, by, by having a relationship with the best God of all, Yahweh Elohim. But that's, again, a different uh, topic for a different talk. Uh, when we go back to some of the literature we have, people will talk about it that way. So, for instance, uh, the Book of Esther is frequently put out there as a um, an example of ancient anti-Semitism. But in fact, it's it's in many ways it's the opposite. So, whoever wrote it was probably living in Persia. It's a diaspora book, and you know the story. I don't have to go over the story of Esther with you. I hope. Um, but uh, the the enemy who's in the book, Haman, Haman. Yes, he is distinctly a Jew hater. And the book traces his ancestry back to this one particular Canaanite nation that kept attacking the Jews, it was more of a Sinaitic nation, but fictional, uh, called Amalek, who kept attacking the Jews over and over. Whenever you hear Amalek, it's a it's it's supposed to be, it's a stand-in for all the anti-Semites. And by the way, it was used with the Gaza thing too. And I don't think it's, it's certainly accurate when it comes to Hamas, but not with all the people living in Gaza. Uh, I don't think that they are Amalek because Amalek is a nation the Jews are commanded by God to destroy. And apparently did a very, very poor job of it because uh, later on, another fictional entry in our history, by the way, Esther, I hope everybody can see that. It's a wonderful piece of literature, maybe one of the best pieces of literature in the whole Bible. But it is absolutely not history. But it does, it's not even really anti-Semitic. Because, I mean, the king, yeah, it's a secret from him, but he doesn't seem to have any knowledge too much of these people. Like Haman has to convince him there's these people live there. It's just really more of somebody's imagination. It, it, it can't be at all. Now, Hanukkah is sometimes portrayed when it comes to the Greco-Assyrians. Uh, the Seleucids as being anti-Semitic, but there's nothing in that story to me that that speaks of anti-Semitism. Um, we know that it was originally a civil war. We have that much knowledge of it. And the civil war had to do with how much we're going to Hellenize, how much we're not going to Hellenize. And the, to the extent that Antiochus Epiphanes III gave two hoots about the people living down there, it was just because he essentially wanted to uh, control the economy and make sure, make sure things were, were peaceful for trade. And that's why he got involved in that war, because he was uh, he was he was asked to by the uh, the Jews who were losing, <laughs> who were not the Maccabees. The Maccabees won, and even they were clearly kind of uh, kind of Hellenized. But what about the Romans? Were the Romans anti-Semitic? We're not. We don't know. We don't know how they felt about the Jews. We do know that they were asked to enter the land of Israel because the by then, quite Hellenized kingdom of the Maccabees, which is known as the Hasmonean Empire, had gone to gone to pot. It was a disaster. It was less than 100 years old, and it was failing on every level as a state, And uh, which some people fear may be happening in Israel, too. I mean, to take away the Gaza war for a minute, which is temporarily unified Israelis, remember the, how fractious the country was becoming. Um, although, complete aside, totally parenthetical. I don't know if you all heard that Netanyahu appointed a judge to defend Israel in the uh, Hague, in the in the uh, World Court of Justice. Anybody hear this? Do you know who he appointed? Aharon Barak. Aharon Barak is indeed a great, a great uh, uh, jurist. Uh, he is also the man whose complete legacy they have been working now for uh, all these months of protest before the war to erase. Is that not hysterical and ironic? He went to the guy who now he has to admit is the most fair and honest and open and really liberal jurist in the nation who created this idea of how to do judicial review, which they didn't have before in Israel. They had it, but they didn't have a theory of it because they, we didn't have a theory of it either until Marbury versus Madison. I hope you all know that. It's not in the Constitution. But you have to have judicial review, right? 
And that's what Israel's been talking about. Um, and they've been talking about it because it was Aaron Barak who created the Israeli version of it. All right, close parentheses. I just wanted to share that little thing with you because I don't think a lot of people saw that in the news. It was really like insider baseball um, uh, Israel news. But anyway, the um, getting back to the Romans, um, the Romans, yeah, they did treat the they did treat the Judeans uh, badly from time to time. But keep in mind too that they weren't the only people who they did that to. Theirs was a uh, a very uh, egalitarian decision to impose sort of cosmopolitan nature on everyone. Like, don't get involved in each other's affairs. Don't mess with each other. And they saw the Jews, and this was true at the time, they saw the Jews as being very itchy to proselytize others in their surrounds. That sounds really freaky to us today because we have been we have been accustomed for 2000 years now maybe 18 1700 years to be fair to the timeline to regard Jewish proselytization as something that's non-existent and it is pretty much non-existent. And in fact to view um requests for conversion into Judaism as being suspect. But that all started with this, and it increased during the Christians, because the Christians imposed penalties on it. Jews were more than happy to convert people. And in fact, the Hasmoneans themselves had not only converted people willy-nilly, but they forcibly converted the Idumeans, the, uh, who were the, the descendants of the Edomites in southern, what would be now be southern Israel, the Negev, and that area forcibly converted them one of their one of the uh, uh, sons of a forcibly converted woman was so pissed off about the way that it was done that when the romans made him king he decided to take it out on all the jews in judea and his name was herod and he was an idumean jew who had been whose mother had been forcibly converted so these romans were more afraid that the jews were a bunch of religious fanatics who were going to harm the mosaic of belief. I mean, the Jews were also seen as kind of being wacky for their whole one God, invisible God theory, because that was considered, by the way, by a lot of people's atheism, if you can believe it. And Jews were readily and frequently accused of atheism in the, some of the few texts that we have about this. But any, any of this is purely speculation. It's based on very few uh, very few uh, documents that we really have. We suspect, I think any scholar who really studies this, and they're the ones I quote, they suspect that this is really this is really a nationalism issue. And the Romans were not interested in everybody's nationalisms anymore. I mean, that was the whole point of their um, of their empire. Um, even a interestingly, in sixty five BCE, where there was a law of for the expel expulsion, of non-citizens from Rome. I don't know what the background was. I read one thing that said it was getting very crowded there and you know, there was just a lot of stuff going on they weren't interested in. But Jews who were citizens of Rome and they could be citizens of Rome were not affected by this. So that, that indicates to me pretty clearly that whatever was going on with Rome, it wasn't that. Now, Jews were in certain places conducting uprisings. But were these uprisings really about anything but politics? And, and to what extent were they really related to the politics of Israel, ironically, or maybe not so ironically, maybe this is just coincidentally, but I don't think it's a complete coincidence um, to what's happening today. And so we see that in Alexandria, for instance, was a, which was a major center of, of uh, uh, Jewish life uh, in, North, in North Africa, there were uprisings against uh, Jews by these Hellenized groups of people. But again, we don't know why it was. Philo, who is the one of the, he's a Jewish philosopher, an ancient Hellenistic Jewish philosopher. He's not, he was not preserved in the Jewish canon. He was preserved by Christians who thought he sounded awfully Christian to them, but he wasn't a Christian either. He, he precedes Christianity um, by any measure, by at least 150 to 200 years. But uh, really, really interesting guy. And he studied in Jewish quarters now. Uh, but he he reported in a, one of his very rare um, historical texts that it was really the that the Jews refused to worship Caligula, 
And as we know, Caligula was a distinctly different kind of, of, of emperor. Uh, he had plenty of people who hated him and would, for a variety of reasons, not want to be worshipping him. So in, in Alexandria in 38 CE and 66 CE, there were outbreaks of violence, 66, clearly related to the Jewish war. But again, what was the Jewish war? It was an uprising of Judeans against what they felt to be Roman I suppose, and most of them probably didn't agree with this at all, but Roman um, oppression. Well, what kind of oppression? Not letting them do the kind of shit that they had been doing with, for instance, the Idumeans. Is that oppression? Or is that asking people just to behave them da their damn selves and to, you know, get with the program and not do things that are considered to be obnoxious to the kingdom that they themselves asked to join? So you can't call any of these things anti-Semitic. They don't really work on that kind of level. However, this is the time frame where we begin to see something emerging. And it's going to be the, the topic of our talk next week. Because at around this time, I'm sorry, not next week. It's two weeks from today. It's two weeks. We're going to be off next week because I'm traveling, uh, storm permitting. Um, this this is a the first real piece of evidence that we have, and we're going to study it together. It is a work by a Jewish historian. If you don't know this name, I hope that you'll look it up before long today. Josephus. Josephus was a soldier in the Jewish armies um, in the uh, in the eighth century, uh, the seventh century BC. Uh, not BC. Slow down, Jeff. The seventh century CE during the Jewish wars. He had um, he had lost the big battle in the north. He was the commander in the north at a place called Gamla. If you've been to Israel and you've gone up to the Golan, you know you you probably have seen Gamla. It's a, a hill that looks like a camel's back, which is where it, uh, the name Gamla comes from uh, in Aramaic. And uh, for whatever reason, the Romans let him join up and follow them around, and he became I don't know what you'd call like an embedded journalist. And he recorded the events of that war. And he also recorded the events of uh, the Jews in the past. He told his own history. I've used him a bazillion times, as everybody's heard of him. He's not a person who ever teaches Jewish history, at least from a non-right-wing Orthodox point of view, who doesn't bring Josephus to bear. But Josephus also was a great defender of the Jews. He said, all right, we lost the war, but I'm still on our side. <laughs> And so, uh, and in fact, he was a he was a bit of a peace stick. He realized the errors of that war's ways. And as you all know, four years later, after sixty six, when the war started, the temple was destroyed. So that was something of significance. But the pro the book that we're going to start with, or the the, the text we're going to start with next week, after I give you just a little bit more introduction to it, is by something that he wrote called Against Appian or Apian, I don't know how to, it's, this is the, it's in Greek. Um, it's a book that was written, Apian, was written by somebody who truly hated Jews in a sort of um, proto-racial way, or however you want to describe it, because it's not just religion. Um, the person doesn't seem to have understand religion. We don't have the book anymore. We don't have this horrible anti-Semitic text. We only have Josephus's retorts but they're fine. They help us understand exactly what Appian said. It's as if we, and this will never happen, of course, because in the modern days, this would be impossible, but it's as if every copy of Mein Kampf disappeared and we only had the criticisms of Mein Kampf to go by. We could probably still figure it out, figure out what Mein Kampf said based on, I mean, I've never read Mein Kampf, but I kind of have an idea of what it said because I've read a lot of people talking about Mein Kampf. Well, we don't have a lot of people talking about the Apion book, whatever the name of it was. But this guy, Apion, who was some kind of scholar of his day, wrote what was clearly a terrifically hateful tale of the Jews and created some of our very first documentable stereotypes and, um, and disgusting characteristics that some of which lasted forever uh, and still are attached to Jews. And we have, we're going to learn them all from Josephus.